Hello, random stranger. I'm glad you're back for more Keep Your Hands Off A Uh This show has such a vibrant energy to it, and it's also awesome to have a bunch of you guys to just nerd out over all the little details about the animation and the weird setting and the characters as well. So last time, our girls really made a power statement to the rest of the school by showcasing what they can do with really limited resources and time. So Studio Azoken is open for business. They've finally been elevated to official club status and I think they got their 60,000 yen budget. Uh, for me, the most satisfying thing was at the end when Kanamori, Asukusa and Sasaki weren't even really aware or they didn't care that they had wowed the entire auditorium with the immersiveness of their finished product. All they cared about was that they had actually created this um, animation with their own blood, sweat and tears and I guess like soar into the future into this vast limitless landscape of creative possibilities that accomplishing this first step had opened up to them. And I guess that's the aim, right? Like to feel the joy of your own work and to be subject to no one else's standards but your own and to be running your own race. And yeah, I just think that that applies to any passion project in any field, which is why it was so satisfying seeing that end result. Both episodes did a great job of showing the grueling, often compromised field process of making animation. And just a small detail at the start of episode 3, I loved how they posed in the shape of their new logo, which is also the kanji for film. Uh, actually, I do have the screenshot here. Yeah, this one. Let me just move over. Uh, yeah, so things like that, like cute small things just show you how passionate they are about this new venture of theirs. The other small random thing I noticed about the world that this is set in, uh, following on from the air conditioner in episode one that was over the doorway, and then in episode two, the staff room that used to be a swimming pool. In episode three, the school cafeteria had these um, really awesome ordering booths with the microphones that they swipe their cards against, and I don't know if they actually have those in Japan. Um, we certainly don't have them here. But yeah, all those little details make the setting feel oddly futuristic, but also contemporary at the same time. It's almost like they took our existing world, but then just added these curious slight twists to the most everyday of things, enough to like make you raise an eyebrow and feel like this is in an alternative universe. And in this week's regular Kanamori Appreciation Corner, uh, Youngblood mentioned loving how Kanamori gets so involved in the project herself. She's punching holes in the paper, she's editing, researching software, etc. Um, she's not just a producer or a manager, she also learns the reasons and motivations for everything so she can communicate with the artistic side in the same terms. Yeah, I love that about Kanamori too. She's always telling the other two to not get ahead of themselves, like you need to fix the building first or we only have a very limited time to produce something great. But she says it always in a way that respects their vision and their opinions. Uh, although the difference between Kanamori and the other two couldn't be more stark. Like while Kanamori was reading out her manifesto on the torturous need to balance profits with achieving their dreams, Mizusaki is just poking a branch into a fan having a fun time and then pretty soon she and Asukusa are off chasing that raccoon dog and butterflies and Kanamori gets pissed which I actually love seeing because she has such a physical presence about her. For one, she is way taller than the other two but also when she's enforcing her discipline, the camera angles pan from below upwards, just emphasizing her tight grip on the reins even more. But for all her grumbling and her threats, Kanamori still helps in that mission to fix the spaceship. I love, I love that transition of her launching that rescue pod and then breaking through the wall to help rescue the other two from the bladder crisis. 
Also how dramatically she grabbed the ladder and slammed it up against the edge of the roof. And that was badass too. I thought she'd gone through the wall because she'd gotten so into this imaginary space world. But yeah, so thank you coding only for clarifying that it was actually because the table she was fixing was blocking the exit. There was also uh, another glimpse into Kanamori's quite complex character during the conversation between her and Mizusaki after Asukasa goes outside to cover the external uh, holes in the walls. And Mizusaki points out that despite Kanamori expressing her doubt over Asukasa's ability to be serious about the repairs, Kanamori still admires Asukasa. To which Kanamori replies, gross. But she then goes on to explain in quite a fond way why she respects Asukasa so much that um, it's because Asukasa will do something difficult if she's passionate about it. And it was cute to see that uh, rough admiration in Kanamori for Asukasa, even though she doesn't show it all the time. Uh, her character, Kanamori's character, it's like sharp around the edges, but there's a well of respect and care buried deep underneath as well. It was doubly cool that Mizusaki was the one who was able to get those words out of Kanamori. It showed uh, Mizusaki's perceptiveness, especially about people, which maybe comes from having grown up a child actress and needing to appeal to human emotion on the most base of levels, or possibly because of a complicated rich family kind of upbringing. Um, and I was thinking Mizusaki's gift for perceiving human emotion might also be why she loves drawing human forms and subtle facial expressions. She's good at picking up those things in real life and so she wants to translate them into art form. Something else I really appreciate is how comfortable Mizusaki is with Kanamori and Asakusa. You could see the contrast between how she is with them and how she is with the general public. Um, like when they got in the monorail, which has posters of Mizusaki's face everywhere. And this was my favorite shot. Uh, yeah, this one. Um, you've got Mizusaki's model face behind them while the real Mizusaki is actually pulling a stank face and arguing with Asakusa over who gets to sit on the end seat. Her whole demeanor changes too when the fans come up and shake her hand. It's just nice seeing that she's got friends that she can just be real with. The last two episodes also showcased in particular the differences between Kanamori and Mizusaki uh, and I guess also the tension sometimes between them as well. Kanamori is all about making a big impact with as little effort as possible. Quality isn't the main goal here, it's more impressing the student council enough to secure a budget. But Mizusaki, she wants to take time, like time that they don't really have to make something perfect. She also wants to pay tribute to um, realism. It's all about animating everyday things like skidding down an incline or falling or the movements of the ocean or dogs. And Mizusaki said something pretty significant that she doesn't just want to make anime, she wants to make animation that is true to real life. Which Kanamori tells her, at least for the budget meeting that's coming up, will be too plain and not eye-catching enough. Sorita wrote that their favorite line on animation is Mizusaki saying, Animation is supposed to be about motion and animators are supposed to make stuff move. Uh, it sounds so obvious, but in the sea of mass-produced anime adaptations with minimal movement we see nowadays, it's easy to forget. To many people in the industry, animation is their passion, not anime. Otherwise, why would they subject themselves to embarrassing work conditions with little remuneration? Yeah, often the artist will have differing opinions to the end consumer or the producer or the marketer who has to sell the show to some big corporation. Um, so differing opinions on what makes a certain anime spectacular. And even Asakusa talked about how humiliating it is to have to sacrifice story and um, animation in order to produce something that's just a preview for the sake of getting to the next production stage. But you know, luckily, as we said before, Kanamori and really all three of the girls are very reasonable people. 
they discuss and then they bargain over how they can satisfy both the objective of making a big enough splash and also letting Mizusaki and Asakusa take pride and joy in their own work. So cutting frames doesn't necessarily mean foregoing quality and it was watching them tussle through that whole process that made episodes three and four so satisfying. Throughout the process, uh, Asakusa played an interesting uh, mediator role where she'd listen to both Kanamori and Misusaki's arguments and then suggest a practical way forward that reached some acceptable compromise. Like when Kanamori says they need to limit the production time and the frame rate, Asakusa has all these ideas for how to reduce the number of required frames by using camera pans and focus shots and certain lighting or having the girl wear a spacesuit and a gas mask so that they only have to animate her facial expressions in close-ups. Um, oh, by the way, that tour through Ascus's, uh stockpiled drawings with the three of them in their construction hats was fantastic. The still water color images with the flipping of the pages and them walking in and amongst Ascus's drawings was very cool. Um, also, when they started testing the tank, it turned into the hand-drawn art and the way that they explained how explosions would work, including the delayed sound effects, was just such a clever visual way to represent what actually happens when artists mull over ideas in their heads and then add or take things away based on what would or wouldn't work in the setting that they're imagining. Which brings us to the budget uh, deliberation council meeting. The student council was badass, as was the building where the meeting was held. It had those traditional gabled roofs and the like rice sliding doors. I don't know what they're called. The shoji sliding doors with the dragon print on them. It kind of reminded me of <laughs> those ancient gangster movies. Uh, anyway, so Kanamori gets just a few words into their presentation when the student council president starts shooting these accusations at them. And the girl who's not president but looks like she's actually the one in charge labels Eizouken a public enemy. That clash between Kanamori and an uh, unnamed council badass member those two VAs with their very smooth, lower register voices kind of gave me chills, which was awesome. You'd expect um, Kanamori to be the one to bring the bacon home, but it's actually Asakusa who delivers the killing blow. Um, Asakusa, actually, she looks like she's going to be sick throughout most of the thing, but the student council's heckling eventually makes her snap. Uh, and... Yeah, Ren, Tristan, De La Cruz had an interesting comment about that. Uh, they wrote, I like Asakusa's I'm shy but I must speak moment. When she started ranting in front of the student council, she was also trying to hide her head inside her clothes by pulling her clothes upward. She's like a turtle hiding its head inside the shell. I hadn't noticed the turtle thing, but yeah, you're right. It's like she naturally just hates confrontation or any sort of negotiation, which is more Kanamori's natural habitat. But if you push Asakusa hard enough, she will bite back. And I love that aspect of Asakusa's character that character and passion that we got to see. Um, I think, I can't be certain, but Asakusa's also speaking a kind of rough dialect during her outburst, I believe. Um, in any case, she convinces the council to let them run their preview, and then by then it's game, set, and match. The other thing that gave me chills was the fact that we got to see the entire preview um, with the title screen and everything. It was so rewarding watching the girls be able to make everything that they'd imagined in their heads bleed out into the real world and um, it's something that Taz commented on too. So I love how they mixed reality with fiction in this one. Though I say it every time, it felt slightly different to the usual since it was other people being drawn into the girls' imaginations through their animation and not just the three of them going off into their own world. Yep, exactly. It was cool how the preview started in in monochrome but within seconds the people in the auditorium were experiencing it in full color and sound and movement and Asakusa said something interesting also after they'd watched it in its entirety for the first time themselves that 
Sometimes you don't really know the impact of a finished product until it's been seen. And the comparison that I thought of immediately when I heard that was um, Beethoven, the classical composer. So Beethoven was still able to compose beautiful music even after he'd become deaf because he could hear it all in his mind, just like the Aesokin girls saw their animation in their minds. And he wasn't ever able to hear his finished compositions ever again, but he was able to see the impact of his music um, on the audiences that heard it, which was, you know, it gave him back some measure of artistic pride. At the end of episode four, it was awesome how the girls' seats are turned away from the audience and towards the screen. It goes to show that their desire to create something great was the most important thing um, and not the approval of others, even though that did help in getting their budget approved. Uh, I also love how even Kanamori at the end is picking out these tiny flaws that she saw, including that one frame that was missing a shadow. I certainly didn't pick up on that, but then again, these girls are pros at this point. Also, Kanamori was smiling, which I thought would never happen, and hopefully we get to see more of that in later episodes. Alright guys, let's get started on episode 5. Um, if you're ready, let's do this in 3, 2, 1, play. What's happening? This is not their imaginary world. <gasps> Are we getting a mech episode? Mizusaki is fearless, like Kanamori, but in a different way. Uh... <laughs> you know, because I don't watch mech anime, so there's probably all these references that are flying over my head right now. If you do know, let me know. Oh. <laughs> this is amazing horror action music, though. It's like film noir. <laughs> There was so much detail. So much detail, but it looks plain. <laughs> She's like the criminal mastermind. It makes sense. <laughs> it's like every sci-fi trope. Mm. 
Yo, they got some extra helpers? Oh, are they from the art club? Ah, uh, the robot club. Damn. Wait, these are anime robots, right? No, these are real ones. Wait, it's, the year was like 2000, so this isn't too far into the future, right? Hey, <laughs> there's that turtle stance again. Damn, don't punch Kanamori man, she'll punch back twice harder. Whoa. <laughs> Uh, kind of body's world view, man. It's so real. Ah, uh, but you make everything smaller, right? Oh my gosh, too many subs. <laughs> they're like too many details. It's so cool how they're talking about this giant mecha bot um, and how realistic it has to be when the whole concept is just sci-fi and fantasy. It's amazing. That's the whole thing, isn't it? Like, every single episode, they're doing these fantastical things, but also, uh, at the same time, thinking about, realistically, how would the physics work, how would the sound effects work, the energy sources. <laughs> it's so cool. It's just flirting that very thin line between reality and the impossible. Well, Ascus has got all the cute things. He's waiting for the drop. So good. I love how it's just uh, the title of the show in focus and then all of these crazy objects just hovering around it. Oh, a secret tunnel is under the school. <laughs> it's a bit of a scary cat, Askusa. I wouldn't go down there. 
She's gonna lockpick this. Like inspiration from the settings, yeah. <laughs> What's with the hooded, like, the, the eyes? Poltergeist, what? <laughs> Monsters, not ghosts. Oh, just like a little kid. That's cute. Mmm. Mmm, that's good PR. Yeah. <laughs> the irony. <laughs> She's watched a lot of anime, so she'll know all the classic, like, death traps. This is crazy. Hmm. Oh. Hey, remember last time how she was like, oh, I've never done explosions before? She's picking up a lot of new stuff, I feel. About setting design. That's cool. That is true. Yeah, I feel like Askasa, she just needs to be get, get really passionate about something. And then she forgets. <laughs> A crab tool? A crab turtle. <laughs> Ew, legs are covered in scales. Can defeat an African elephant in an instant. <laughs> yeah. That is cute. <clears throat> oh, that'd be so good. I don't know, I have a feeling it'd be too big for the meat to be sweet. Isn't that just a... a lightsaber? <laughs> oh, wait, this has to be imaginary, right? No, it's not. <laughs> No, <laughs> that's bad. What's underneath it? <laughs> mm. 
<laughs> yeah, the Swiss Army knife that everyone carries around with them. Damn, she she came prepared. I feel like there just has to be a door that's just there. <laughs> oh, they got out. Oh, that was quick. Oh! <laughs> just cut right to the heart of it. <laughs> this Kanamori with her psychological mind games. Ah, oh, she's so good at that stuff. Hey, girls in this robot club. Oh, come on, dude. That <laughs> is a bit full on, hey. <laughs> Instead of realism. <laughs> he is gonna be get the shock of his life. It's so funny given how much about realism Mizusaki was talking about last episode. <laughs> She's so confident. She's gangster. She's so gangster. <clears throat> Why is the table so long? <laughs> The claw of a pistol shrimp. <laughs> mm. There's your realism for you. Oh. I love how it's down to like the decimal point. They've got all the details worked out. So you don't want action, but you want a giant fighting robot. <laughs> yeah, the contradiction is glaring with this dude. <laughs> Too much realism, guys.
Uh, there we go. There's the crux of the issue. I love how they put the thoughts above their head. <clears throat> uh, yeah, not everyone has that gift. What's a hard dog in? This might work, you know, empathy. Yeah. <laughs> Once again, it's the emotion that wins out, despite all of Kanamori's brilliant planning. <laughs> Yo, the others don't have their construction hats. Maybe because they're not the ones that are visualizing this. <clears throat> but in some weird way, it all works in Ascus's head, you know. She can see things other people can't. Yo, look at this meshing of uh, knowledge and expertise from the robot side and then from the animation side. That's cool. That looked familiar, like that shape of the helmet. There's some really old anime that has that. <laughs> Not anymore. Oh, we can actually feel the force, like. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> this is like a long way from just the chainsaw. <laughs> it's like a massive robot Swiss army knife. Yes, Mizusaki is all about like the movement and making it walk. What's that like, wearing like pants? Oh, nice. No, next episode is when they actually animate this crazy mech. <laughs> 
Uh, I love that we're getting more people interacting with the Azoken Club. Because really like testing their ability to be able to sell what's in their head to other people who can't see their vision at all. <sighs> Which is what a lot of animators have to deal with actually. Like it's hard when, because not everyone has that artistic eye. And when you can't see it, it's hard to approve something. And if that doesn't work, then Kanamori, you know, can blackmail. There's always blackmail <laughs> with Kanamori. There's always a good plan B. I love how Kanamori sort of runs hunched over to me. Okay. Okay, guys, we are on to episode six, where hopefully we're going to see how this giant mech versus crab turtle, crab tool fight uh, pans out. So if you are good to go, let's do it in three, two, one, play. <laughs> I love she's wrapped in a blanket. Yeah, the story and the narrative was what they had to sacrifice last time for action. Mm. I mean, who wouldn't? It was so impressive. They've got a lot of clout now. Oh man, outsourcing the art. That's a difficult thing, isn't it? Like it's in one way, it's easier to do everything yourself, but also it's impossible for you to make anything big. You have to recruit other people. Ah, oh, nice. No. <laughs> 500 pieces. This sounds like hell. I mean, you can make slight compromises, right? Yeah, here we go. Damn, right, she's gonna go to the black market, find a cheap PC. <laughs> or blackmail someone and be like, hey, you owe me this. Oh man, second big project. It's so hectic, this song. <laughs> Uh, 
I love how it's just a repeat of these frames. <laughs> and then this part, when it kind of slows down a bit and their dance moves reflect that. <laughs> that's right. And why does Kanamori only drink milk? Maybe that's why she's so tall. Just milk from birth and nothing else. Yeah. Man, this is such an earworm. <laughs> Just staring brutally out at the stars. <laughs> Yakuza. Uh. Even Askusa recognizes Kanabri's ah uh, gangster qualifications. <gasps> Yo, did she just really use her glasses to tie her hair up? Oh, she's cute like that. Mm. Oh, <laughs> for various reasons. Bigger the better, right? Are they eating the... <laughs> what are they eating? Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> the, the alert sounds. Ugh, these rough lines are amazing. Looks like those drawings that artists can do in like a minute or minutes. <laughs> those really rough lines. Ah, a storyboarding. Yeah, she's the movement girl, right? Yeah, play to your strengths. <laughs> I love how kind of what he just hung her jacket up. She looks very at home wherever this restaurant is. That sounds like a lot. 
That's more? What? Oh, okay, it's not. <laughs> Oh, look at all these connections with the other clubs. <laughs> oh, man. It's trying to do everything for next to nothing cost. It's exhausted. I love how you can hear kind of what he's breathing in the background. <laughs> oh, more student council. Oh, I love these two together. Drone photography club. Lure appreciation club. I mean, they've got diversity. <laughs> you gotta hand it to them. Oh, I love this view of like her walking past all the club rooms from the top down. Music club. It's gonna blast her ears off. <laughs> Assert dominance. Oh my gosh. Yo, look at that music mixer. That is quite the collection. <laughs> uh, cha ching you know what I love when they visit these new clubs or clubs that they're yet to interact with they always meet people that are just as passionate as them you know about their various things In winter, specifically. <laughs> Askusa is all over this too. Yo, this badass Kanamori music. Uh, <laughs> search warrant. Oh. <laughs> I love this constant referring to Kanamori as part of the Yakuza. Oh, 
got slap her with that paper. Oh, those thing those posters on the ceiling. Oh, it's just her. Mm. Or, I mean, they can't she just work for them on their film? Oh, the different, it all sounds the same. Yeah, that's weird, eh? She's like, oh, the horror, why isn't it changing? Ugh. <laughs> it's triggering her. That was that was I love that. <laughs> yeah, she's got to help him now. For the sake of sound, the integrity of the art form. Continued existence. Hey, commission fee. It's got it all worked out. All of it. Yeah, plus she can work on something that she's actually passionate about too. How? <laughs> Negotiated, done. Don't make you. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Askers are just not, you know, the photo taking type. It's all business, man. Oh man, now I can't wait to see how the sound effects come out in the final product. Mm. It's either huge spurts of creativity or nothing at all. It's no in between. It's like that with writing too. Does kind of what he have her finger on uh, Ascus's motivation switch? I wonder. Doesn't seem like she does. <laughs> She's always holding a little bunny. Just that's a small art club. <laughs> oh, 
Shiva. It's actually, because I never really gave too much thought about this before, but there's such a huge difference between art and animation, although you wouldn't really think there would be. <laughs> this is cute. <laughs> is that something they didn't think of? Oh, look at those busts at the top. Oh, so much more complications when you're working with other people. <laughs> Having a bit of a crisis. What? Reclaimed land from a lake. She's having a eureka moment. This is too much detail, right? Oh no, I think I feel like she's overthinking things. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely having a creative crisis. Mm, you can't. Yeah. Oh, Kanamari is so sweet. <laughs> Yo, what? <laughs> Uh, she's thinking a lot about what people will think. Yeah, the robot police. Hmm. Yep. You'll always have your critics. You can't please everyone. <laughs> Wise words. Yep. Oh. So I'm giving some mental fortification there. <laughs> That's epic music. Oh, direct, uh, so fired up. Uh, looks like we're going to be getting the completed product in the next episode. Oh, even the one after that. Changing the interior. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so her motivation switch completely uncontrollable and you just gotta let her run wild out there in nature and just let the brain do all the work oh man i'm getting pretty hyped about this giant robot mech animation it's got sound effects they've got the movement of the robot and all the techie details worked out Can't help but feel like, again, with these two episodes, it's like the animators are speaking through all of the issues that they're facing, that those are the issues that they've faced before. Everything from the difficulties of working with other people to figuring out what you can and can't cut and also just dealing with the mental burden of having to please so many different groups of people that you know it's impossible you know you gotta pick and choose your battles and just be okay with being criticized it's so hard man All right, so two key messages that I feel those episodes conveyed so well and in such an entertaining way. One, the more people that are involved with your project, the more complicated and difficult it is to actually make it work. And two, that you can't please everyone and you shouldn't try to. So yeah, it feels like this show is just expanding at a really rapid pace. Uh, the girls have their first paid job, which is to help the robot club animate this giant mech fight scene as a promotional piece at the culture festival. But that means now that they have to explain and try to help others visualize their own ideas. And that's not easy when you're naturally just not on the same wavelength. Um, it's also not easy when you have to deal with characters like that. The head of the robot club, I forget if he had a name, but the dude who was ironically very worried that Azokan would turn his ideal mech fight into this super unrealistic, ridiculous anime when he was the one who had all of these fantastical ideas about what it should be like to drive a giant humanoid mech. Um, so yeah, in the real world, you've got to deal with people who don't realize that what they're requiring you to do is actually contradictory. And it takes some deft emotional manipulation, at least in Kanamori's case, or just some genuine emotional connection in Asakusa and Mizusaki's case to break through to that guy and to convince him to take on board their ideas. Domeki, I love Domeki, uh, the sole member of the sound or the, the audio club who has an amazing collection of sound effects and has effectively been drafted into the Azoken club as an advisor. That scene where she got triggered by the <laughs> lack of diversity or the realism in the Azoken club's existing library of sound effects was a treat. Uh, I really felt for her when you were so passionate and knowledgeable about a particular field and sometimes you see something that falls far below your personal standards you start to get those twitchy eyes so yeah that was super super relatable uh for me it's probably more in writing that i get that twitchy feeling but i think everyone has their thing where um they're just very particular about the details kind of muddy these two episodes just being a total badass again uh but this time often in the background She's cutting all these deals with the other clubs because now they actually have, you know, some reputation to trade off of. Um, she's outsourcing like some of their work to the art club and she's secured a PC from the computer club. She's just really pulling in the late hours for the sake of this next production. And I love also how when Askus's brain was overheating and she was experiencing this overwhelming doubt that they can even do justice to this giant mech fight animation. Kanamori really steps up and steps in and gives Asukusa that very much needed pep talk or pep yell. 
Her advice to just stop worrying about what everyone else is expecting of you and to just draw. So do what it is that you do and let your creativity guide you. That was some amazing pull your shit together (laughs) motivational speech. And it was so true. Like inevitably everyone around you will have a different idea of what will work and what won't. And at some point you have to trust in your own ability to, I guess, make the right call And you have to be discerning enough to know that when you can, I guess, well, know when you can incorporate compromise and when it would be unreasonable or even uh, detrimental to do so. That's it for this week's Azogan Reaction. Thank you guys again for joining me. And now I need to go back and rewatch those episodes because there was so much detail in things like the mech draft drawings and just so many subtitles flying everywhere that I definitely missed some things. Uh, or you can let me know uh, which details in particular that got you the most. And yeah, I'll see you again soon for more Azoka next time. Until then, take care, guys.